Welcome everyone. I am from India and I'm Sarika. I'm going to be your host today. I am a part of the Kodi International Institute. I work with the International Center for Women's and Feminist Leadership. So a very, very warm welcome aboard. We have two guest speakers with us uh, who have been a part of both the feminist movement and the queer movement per se. In fact, Noor, who comes from Indonesia, she has been an activist, an academic, and holds a doctorate from, from SOAS, has been a part of the movement even before it was sort of given this pejorative term called queer. And she'll be talking a lot about her own lived experiences. Arvind Narayan is a lawyer from India. He has been a part of the movement and he was a part of, of the, uh, the decriminalization of a very, very colonial law that India had, which not just stigmatized, but also criminalized homosexuality. So welcome, Arvind, and uh, welcome, Noor. Um, a hearty welcome to both of you. Uh, I want to welcome everyone uh, from all over the world who is here. Uh, and, and I'm hoping that we'll keep this very interactive in the last one hour. So why do we call it Queering Feminist Movement? Um, is, is something that we are going to discuss a lot. But just to begin with, we know that, you know, there is a normalization of heterosexuality. I mean, to such an extent that it's called heteronormative and which makes homosexuality a deviance. And I think in the feminist movement, we have always opposed these binaries and binaries are simplistic. Feminist movement is all about diversity and pluriversality. And that is why it is very, very important that, that when, as and when we start discussing a feminist discourse and the whole politics of it, we must consider the queer politics, you know, as, as a very strong pillar and a foundation of feminism itself. So in today's session, we are going to put heterosexuality under a very critical scrutiny. And, and not just that, but also consider the historicity of colonialism and colonization. And how many of our cultures, which were not so homophobic per se, were converted and it was criminalized and stigmatized. And again, a very, very warm welcome to both Arvind and Noor for joining us today. What we are going to do is listen to them from their own lived experiences as, as you know, people who have fought and people who have not just been in activism, but also unpacked it and written about the discourse itself. So another welcome to you, Arvind, and to Noor. Uh, I'm hoping that Noor will join us from the backstage while Arvind speaks. So over to you, Arvind. I have just started it and and people are most welcome to type their comments in the in in the chat box or uh, ask your questions in the q a whichever you would like and i think we'll keep the last 30 minutes for a very very interactive session so yeah. over to you arvin thank you sarika for that really warm kind and very uh, generous uh, introduction it's always a pleasure to be here but uh, it would have been lovely to be there face to face, but I think we work with the, the limitations that we have and do the best that we can. Sarika's smile tells you that, you know, it's possible to even convert a room into a more warm, hopeful and affectionate place. So thank you for giving that great welcome. And uh, <laughs> I want to begin by obviously the context in, uh, in India today. All of you will know that we're in a very interesting time because two days ago, we had the judgment delivered by the... By the by the Indian Supreme Court on the entire question of marriage uh, marriage equality. And again, if you have to unpack that judgment a little bit and see what the judges really did, what the judges really said, one way of doing it, of course, is trying to give it a bit of a historical context and saying, how did we get to this particular place itself? And I think that's worth doing because again, India is not Canada. India is not the United Kingdom. India is not the United States. India is a part of the global South. And uh, 
has many of the ways of, uh, of thinking of the Global South. And we've often thought of the Global South as being, in many cases, uh, more conservative when it comes to questions of gender and sexuality. And India has definitely been more conservative when it comes to questions of gender and sexuality. But uh, how do we get to a place when in October, two days ago, the 17th of October, 2023, the Supreme Court delivered a judgment which did not recognize the right to marry. But we had two judges who recognized the right to form associations or a civil union. The majority said, you don't have a right to marry. The majority basically said that there's no fundamental right to marry in the Indian constitution. The majority basically said, we can't interpret the Special Marriage Act to include within its framework, same sex or uh, transgender, or same sex, same, same sex couples in particular. That's what, the, that's what the majority said. But the question again, the question to me is, uh, uh, maybe just to let you know, maybe, maybe I'll do it this way. I'll tell you a little bit in more detail of what the judgment said. And then we'll go backwards from that, from that, from that point onwards. The judgment was heard by five judges of the of the Indian Supreme Court. And the judgment that they delivered was by four of the five judges delivered judgments. And again, those who feel familiar with the with the law will recognize. That is the four judgments out of five judge out of five judges. Then there are areas in which judges agree, the areas in which the judges disagree. So it's quite complicated to come to terms with what the judgment actually is saying. So I'll try and take you a little bit through the complications of what actually the judges have said in this particular judgment. Right? Uh, five judges. The first point is all five judges are unanimous that there is no fundamental right to marry in the Indian constitution. Second point, all five judges are, uh, are unanimous that we can't read the Special Marriage Act, which is the particular legislation under which inter-caste and inter-religious couples can marry, uh, does not include, or cannot be read to include the right of same-sex couples to marry. That's the part of the judgment, which is of course incredibly disappointing incredibly wounding and incredibly hurtful because in effect, the judges are telling you that you don't have a space in the legal framework which exists in the Indian context. But the the attempt to move beyond this is in the, by two judges, which is again, two out of five, which is a minority judgment, but two judges, Justice Chandrachur and Justice uh, Call make the point that the, the constitution recognizes what it calls the right to form associations. When you say right to form associations, normally you think of it as the right to form the register of society, register of trust, register your nonprofit, register your organization, etc. But in this case, they say that the right to associations includes the right to intimate associations and includes the right to form unions. So in effect, they're saying that there's a constitutional right to form relationships which have the right to be recognized by law. So that's the that's what the minority is saying. So the, the way in which they're, they're saying that you might not have a constitutional right to marry. You may not be entitled to recognition on the Special Marriage Act, but you are entitled to recognition for the relationship that you're in, for the intimate association that you're in, uh, under the constitutional framework itself. They go one step further and say that the court has the obligation, or the, sorry, the, the, the the executor and the parliament have the obligation to recognize the rights which flow out of such a relationship. Again, look at it this way. Two people are living together. How is that different? Or what are the rights which flow to two people living together? And the point they delineate, if two people are living together, the range of rights which come in would be, for example, with respect to your entire question of, you know, uh, possible insurance, possible workman's benefits, possible labor law benefits, possible rights when your partner of long standing or, or partner uh, is can't take decisions for himself, then are you entitled to take decisions in a, in, a, in a medical context? Those are the rights which flow. And their point is, the government has the obligation to enact a law, to take care, or to address these gaps which are there as far as this grouping is concerned. The other point that the, the two judges make is when you talk about the right to adoption, the point they're making is that the right to adoption uh, cannot be restricted 
on grounds of marital status. So in effect, they're saying the right to adoption should be open to same-sex couples as well. All very wonderful, all great. But the catch in the, the catch in the point, of course, the catch in the entire question, of course, is that these are two judges. The remaining three judges, which is the majority in this case, say there is no right to intimate association under the Indian constitution, and there is no right to adoption for unmarried couples in the Indian constitution. So that becomes, in this case, a minority view, which is not the which is not the, the the crux of the which is not which is not the judgment which is applicable. The applicable the applicable part of the judgment on this point is you don't have a right to, uh, you don't have a right to form unions or civil unions, and you don't have the right to adoption. So it looks very again very obviously you think there's a glimmer of light when they say hey you know we're recognizing unions, but the glimmer of light fades when they say that it's a minor when when it becomes known that it's a minority opinion. But one more point, just to add to this, to, call, to recognize the complexity of the whole situation, is that uh, the court, the unanimous, sir, all five judges, recognize that transgender people have the right to marry across all laws. Again, sounds fantastic, and it is fantastic in many ways, but there's one limitation. Okay, the limitation is this. If you're a transgender man, you're entitled to marry a woman. If you're a transgender woman, you're entitled to marry a marry a man. If you're an intersex person, you're entitled or you're entitled to marry uh, either a man or a woman based on the gender in which you identify. So there's a question of heterosexuality, which structures the entire question of transgender relationships itself. So while, for example, we definitely welcome the recognition of transgender of a certain segment of the transgender communities to marry, it is not a right which accrues to all segments of the transgender community. We know that the transgender community is a broader community. We know that the range of people who might identify as gender non-conforming, identify as non-binary, their rights are not recognized as far as this particular uh, judgment is, is, is concerned. So that's the, again, a limited step forward, but absolutely not enough. I've said a lot, talked about both the uh, the two small steps forward and the many, many uh, points where the judgment falls short. But one more point I want to make, this links up a little bit to the past, is uh, again, maybe people from the Global South, people from Kenya, people from Uganda will empathize with this point. People in the US and the UK may not necessarily empathize with this point, is we were very pleased to see that the judgment as a whole had no homophobic language. The judges on the whole, even the judges who did not grant or did not recognize the right to form unions, were very respectful in the way they addressed the LGBTQ community. Their point was a technical point, which is that the fact that you know this is a this is a responsibility which must be discharged by the union government. It's not a responsibility which can be put on the shoulders of the court. Their argument was this. Uh, again, just uh, it's, a, it's a technical point, but I'll just make this point. If you want to modify one law on marriage, which is the Special Marriage Act, it will result in a, it will result in you having to modify what they call spider's web of legislation. You can't restrict it to just changing one word because you have to modify a whole range of other laws. I'll just give you one example. The Indian law is very strange, huh? I don't know if the Kenyan law, the Ugandan law, or our colleagues from other parts of the global south, the law is as, as strange. The Indian law is this, that if you're a man, it'll be 20, 21 years to get married. If you're a woman, it'll be 18 to get married. So the question before the court then is, what happens if you're two women? Answer is possibly 18, you can get married. What happens if you're two men? The answer possibly is 21, you can get married. What happens if you're a transgender person? and a woman, transgender person, man, then that I think falls apart, right? So you get the complexities of the way the legal framework is not, does not, is not easily amenable to this change uh, by the judiciary itself. So the judiciary's point is this, if you leave it to us, we will have to rewrite the entire legislation and rewriting the legislation is not something this court can do. So that's the broad argument on why they, they did not agree 
to grant us or to recognize the right to right to right to right to marry. And now I'll just take uh, go. I'll just address one other point on the judgment, which is the 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 question of you know norm. Why am I so excited? Again, uh, maybe colleagues from the Global South will empathize. Why am I so excited over the fact that the ju judges are using non-homophobic uh, or non-exclusionary language? In fact, the judges and it pains all the five judges make it a point to say that we believe LGBTQ people are entitled to human rights. We believe, and they overtly and expressly recognize. They say that you have the right to lead your life without persecution or prosecution by state or society. You have the right to cohabit with the person of your choice. You have the right to enter into loving relationships of the person of your choice. But you don't have the right to get that recognized by the law or the state. That's the limit point that they that they use. Why am I excited by even this, this kind of a uh, recognition? For that, I would have to go back a little bit to, to history and just trace it a little bit back to how we got to 2023. I just do this as briefly as I can because this can normally take you over an hour, uh, which, I, which I won't take. I'm sorry, I promise you I won't take over an hour. I'll try and finish it in 10. How much time do I have? Well, you, you, you do have at least 20 minutes more. 20 please minutes. go ahead. Yes, okay. at least that. You can take okay. a little longer, please. Okay, okay. Fine. fine. Okay. So now we'll go back, right? We'll say we'll go back to the historical context which led to the judgment in 2023 and the range of questions and comments which we can have in the entire dimension. But I'll go back actually to, uh, to again, the colonial intervention of 1860. 1860, when Lord Macaulay drafted the Indian Penal Code, or 18, 1831 he drafted, 1860 it came into force. And again, this is important for all of us in the Global South because the Indian Penal Code is the law which travels on the backs of empire to all parts of the, the ex-British empire. So be it uh, Jamaica, Barbados, be it Ghana, or be it Kenya, or Uganda, be it Singapore, or be it Malaysia, or be it the island states of the, of the, of the, of the Pacific. If they have a law which criminalizes the expression of, uh, of, of intimacy between people of the same sex, uh, if they have a law which criminalizes transgender expression, that comes from the colonial legal uh, order. 1860, the law comes into place. It continues really undisturbed in the Indian context uh, till 1950. 1950, there should be an expectation of change. Why is that so? Because 1950 was the coming into place of the Indian constitution. Why again are we, uh, why we think that's an important point? It's an important moment because the Indian constitution recognizes the, that all persons, again the language, all persons have the right to have the right to uh, life and personal liberty. All persons have the right to equality. All citizens have the right to right to freedom of speech and expression. And the assumption, of course, is you say all persons have these rights. It doesn't say all persons barring LGBTQ people. The assumption that LGBTQ people also are persons and they'd be entitled to these rights. And the the challenging thing or the interesting thing is 1950 to 2009, this issue was never adjudicated before the courts. There's never a challenge saying that, you know, the, the colonial law in 377, which criminalizes the carnal intercourse against the order of nature, violates our right to privacy, equality, or dignity. It was only in 2001 that a petition was filed challenging this particular provision. And 2009, we got a judgment from the Delhi High Court which basically said, again, in a historic uh, historic uh, victory, which basically said that uh, the provision which criminalizes the expression of homosexual uh, love or homosexual intimacy uh, is something which violates the right to life and personal liberty because uh, LGBTQ people have the right to, within the, la the language of liberty and, and life, they have the right to dignity personal and autonomy. And if you have provision which criminalizes an expression of something so intimate as your own sexuality, then what it does is it hits out at your right to dignity. That's the, that's the language that the court used in striking down this particular, or reading down this particular provision. 
The other point I want to make over here, again, this is a point particular to the Indian context, but I think maybe of relevance outside as well, which is the, the fact that they, the judges in this case located the striking down of Section 377 within the Indian constitutional tradition. They said that the Indian constitution is about the principles of equality and is about the principle of constitutional morality. And so we can't have a social morality which is based on treating and tempor temporary expressions of hate or repugnance uh, overriding a constitutional morality. So that is 2009, again, a very, very important, very, very powerful judgment. But again, within it tells you again the, the range of opposition there is. Uh, within, seven day, within seven days, the first appeal against the judgment was filed. And within a, within a couple of months, there were 15 appeals against the judgment by Hindu, Muslim, and Christian religious groups. Again, you get a sense of the fact of the unity of, um, of a range of religions all coming together in their opposition to LGBT, LGBTQ people's rights. Uh, this, uh, the appeal against the judgment is actually successful. And 2013, we get a judgment by the Supreme Court, which strikes down the Delhi High Court judgment. Again, if you go back to the, to, uh, to the, uh, to the articulation around that time, the, uh, uh, one of India's well-known novelists, Vikram said, Describe that as a bad day for law and love. Again, it's a very powerful formulation. It's a bad day for love, obviously, because what the judgment does is it reduces people to nothing more than the sexual acts that they may perform. It says that, you know, it says that LGBTQ people are a minuscule minority and they're what the judge calls the so called rights of privacy and dignity. And it says that, you know, it basically, uh, it basically reduces LGBTQ people to, 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 to non personhood you know, or to, 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 as people don't have the right to be people or the right to be human without the right to be human. And uh, this uh, judgment, again, this might be useful for everybody else from different country contexts. I've so far spoken about it as purely a legal framework. And it's very, very important to understand that the battle which began against three, Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code in India was a social, legal, and political battle. And we saw the battle outside the court as important as the battle within the court. Because we know, and, and, and I'm sure all of us know, that uh, when you talk about biases and prejudices, which are the personal and the intimate sphere, it's very difficult to address those biases and prejudices uh, with a purely legal strategy. You need to be able to try and address the biases and prejudices outside the realm of court as well. So we saw that battle as a wider social political battle. And in fact, the post the 2013 judgment, we had the entire rise, of, we had what we call the no, no going, going back movement, which arose and said that, you know, you can't push us back into the closet and we can't, rights once recognized can't be taken away. That was the line which we use again and again, that, you know, uh, once people have, we have granted rights, or recognized that people have some rights, you can't take them away. Again, it goes back to the language of the Nas judgment, which basically said, that the, the courts do not uh, do not confer rights, they merely confirm rights. Rights are something you have by way to be of being human, and courts can't take them away. So that was the that was the language which we used at that particular moment in time in the advocacy against this particular judgment. And I think this advocacy against the judgment was very important and was very, very successful. Because it finally resulted in 2018 judgment, which was the which was the, the decriminalization judgment given by the Supreme Court in Navdej Dohar's judgment. Again, five judges of the Indian Supreme Court, where Justice Chandrachud was one of the one of, was the current chief justice, who was one of the judges in that particular in that particular court. And what they they held again in Section 377 is violated right to equality, privacy. And dignity. Maybe one other concept I'll put out here, since uh, Sarika mentioned also the feminist interface as far as the queer struggle is concerned, uh, is the understanding of the notion of privacy. Again, this is a point which is I have we've had a lot of uh, conversations around, and I just want to want, want you to hear me out a little bit on this question. I know there's a feminist critique of the idea of privacy because the critique of privacy is based on the notion that uh, a man's home is his castle. If you say a man's home is his castle then there's a possibility for a range of violations 
which happened in the castle, right? Including the entire question of child sexual abuse, marital rape, a range of ways in which uh, gender hierarchy is reinforced in the private domain of the private sphere. The, the point which the judgment of how articulated is the privacy as a zonal notion, which in a sense can be what we're talking about, it also has a relational notion and as a decisional notion. Your privacy is also about your right to make decisions about your intimate self, or your the decisions you make about your body is also about your right to privacy. So another lens on which you approach the right to privacy is the is the is the Roe versus Wade kind of a lens. But you say privacy is about your right to make decisions about your personal intimate life, including your decision whether to have a child or not to have a child, your decision whether to whether to engage in a particular relationship or another particular relationship, those are parts of your right to privacy. So the there's a more full-blooded or a more powerful or a different articulation of the idea of privacy on which this judgment is founded. It was also founded on the on the articulation of the right to dignity. Again, dignity is very important because what do you mean by dignity? Uh, this again is, a, is an experience that's familiar to range of LGBTQ people where the experience of indignity is the experience of humiliation. The experience of humiliation, the experience of being isolated or ostracized because of the sexual acts that you perform or because of the person that you choose to love. And so the again, the argument is that when you have a law which criminalizes an intimate dimension of who you are, it results in the most innermost recesses of, recesses of who you are, which is your, which is your right to dignity. Dignity is about both the, the other humiliation. It's also fundamentally about your right to make decisions about your personal intimate life. Again, if there is somebody, in this case the state, who's coming in and telling you, hey, you know, you can't have a relationship with person A or person B, that's a that's a really an assault on the personal sphere, it's an assault on the intimate sphere, it's an assault on the right to autonomy and the right to make decisions about your personal intimate life. So that's the other core dimension which the judges with the judgment articulated. And the third dimension, of course, which the judgment articulated is that the the when you have a law which uh, which which attacks fundamental your fundamental right to expression, it violates right to expression as well. Expression is not just a question of you know under the constitution, right to freedom of expression is not just the right to speech in the in the conventional sense. It's also about the right to expression, including personal expression, including intimate expression. So if a law which criminalizes your right to express yourself in association with another person, that again is an assault on your right to uh, right to expression and dignity. So again, the point being that equality, dignity, and autonomy all come together in the court's understanding of what 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 are the issues at stake as far as this particular uh, law is concerned. Maybe one more point to make on this is tells you sometimes what the power of a judgment can be. And people have argued, and people have argued that, you know, end of the day, uh, why are we making a song and dance over a judgment like Nathaj, which is a 2018 judgment, says a lot of nice things, but what does it finally do? It reads on one particular provision of the IPC, and we don't even know if that impacts at the level of the police station, the level of individual people. And we did a bit of study on that. You know, two years down the judgment, uh, we did a study and found out that the judgment in Navdej was cited by in 40 plus judgments by the High Court. Look at the range of what those judgments were. Uh, 20 plus judgments were about relationships by either lesbian couples or transgender couples. And why were they citing the judgment? They were couples who were being, who had run away from home and were being harassed or persecuted by their families. And they approached the court and say, we're entitled to live with the person that they love. And the courts invariably say that, of course, you are entitled to live with the person that you love because the constitution recognizes that and the judgment of Nabdeh Singh Johar recognizes that particular right that you have. That was the impact of the judgment. And so that's the history which, uh, which, which behind, before the marriage judgment really came, came into place. So again, the link to the social and political context is this, right? Uh, each time you get a positive judgment of the court, it really unleashes a lot of hope and expectation as far as people are concerned. So 2018 judgment, the impact that we saw is suddenly there's a range of people 
out there in the public sphere who are, who are queer, who are non-binary, and who are claiming their space. And just you go to any event in the Bangalore context, in India context, you will meet a range of people. I would meet a range of people I've never met in my life before. I don't even know them, right? And a lot of them are younger people who are who have come, who have come to terms with their sexuality. In a sense, enabled by the 2018 uh, judgment of the of the Supreme Court. So the the marriage hope was really built on this entire history of advocacy and, and activism. So my, my concluding points on the marriage judgment itself, I'll put it this way, is the battle for decriminalization took us 17 years. The battle for marriage equality began in 2000, uh, sorry, 2020, and 2023, three years down the line, we got this particular judgment of the uh, Supreme Court. So the battle is not over. And still a long way to go as far as as far as this uh, taking the struggle forward is concerned. And I want to sort of end with quoting one uh, poem uh, by this uh, by a Black American gay poet called uh, Langston Hughes. It, it's called "What Happens to a Dream Deferred." It goes like this: uh, What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Does it run like stinking meat, or does it explode? And our submission as part of the, the queer movement in the Indian context is this dream will explode because it is a dream deferred. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Gaya. Thank you so much, Arun. I could listen to that forever. And you know, this comes from someone who's been following the movement and has been in solidarity. But thank you so much for taking us like in a nutshell through the major debates of what has been happening. And, and you know, uh, like you say, a law cannot confer, it can just confirm rights. And, uh, and I like the complexity with which you build the entire discourse. You know, as and when I was reading through this and, and, and being in India currently, you know, my mind kept going back to the questions around representation as to were any of these judges a part of the queer movement, you know, did they understand it? Right. And, and, you know, that's one question that we've always grappled with, even within the feminist movement. And the other thing is, is you know, a very strong interface of how is it that in the kinship system, you know, we imagine that only a heterosexual family can be a family, you know, because, you know, the whole notion of a Victorian morality in which only reproductive logic is the logic that is accepted. And, and I think this really challenges it. And so for the first time, you're, it, and, it, and it shakes the foundations of patriarchy in challenging sexuality. And I think that is why the entire feminist movement needs to stand with it. But thank you so much, Erin, for this. And, and you've really done it in a nutshell. I'm hoping that there will be questions. And if not, you know, I have plenty. And now that we've got this occasion to, to speak to you. For everyone else who joined late, let me tell you that Erwin was a part of, of the, lead, the entire legal advocacy in this. And, you know, understands the nitty gritties, not only the, as, as a lawyer, but also as a person from the queer movement itself. And, and the way he explains it, the questions around privacy, the questions of dignity. And I know some of that may sound a little unfamiliar to people who are not so really aware of the Indian context. But I think this is exemplary in what they have done. And I also feel that you are very large hearted in the way you accept it. You know, it's, it's in, in a lot of people are critiquing it a lot, but for the way you described it, it was both yes and no. You know, well, where have we progressed? You know, even if it in baby steps, which I don't think it was baby steps though. So thank you so much, Arvin. We're going to give you a little break and move to Noor. A very warm welcome to you, Noor. And uh, Noor has been a part of the movement even before it was called a queer movement per se, right? And Noor will be talking about her own journey, you know, as somebody who comes from the lesbian movement, somebody who has been a part of many international people's tribunals and hence has looked at the violation of rights both within Indonesia and globally now as she does and also as an academic. So a hearty welcome to you, Noor. I'm so happy that you could give us this time. And I hand it over to you to talk about your own journey 
and the questions and the dilemmas in, in the movement itself. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Sarika, for uh, the introduction. And also thank you for inviting me uh, to this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, I'm so happy to share with you my uh, experience in uh, creating a feminist uh, movement. Even at the time in nine, uh, 1980s, uh, I don't know um, uh, the concept of queering or even uh, uh, feminist because when I studied uh, law, uh, in uh, I think uh, started seventy seventy three and uh, we were not uh, I was not uh, taught about um, a feminist uh, legal theory whatsoever, uh, but uh, only uh, studied. Uh, Critical legal uh, studies, but not uh, on uh, feminist or women movement. So I learned uh, a lot from uh, uh, feminist uh, organization that was started in Indonesia only in eighty two or eighty four. Uh, I think when um, I was at the time uh, has already active as a uh, legal aid uh, lawyer. Yeah. So uh, uh, actually, um, Indonesia has a uh, long uh, history. Uh, yeah, on uh, women activism uh, that dates uh, to as early as uh, 90s, early 90s, I think. Um, also, Islamic Women's uh, Organization uh, was born uh, for the first time in 1917 uh, under the uh, organization uh, Muslim uh, mass organization Muhammadiyah. Uh, that uh, Muhammadiyah is a really strict uh, Muslim organization. Uh, then in 1926, uh, the other uh, uh, mass Muslim organization uh, was born. Uh, along with a uh, women's uh, wing called uh, Muslima. It's, uh, it's uh, rather uh, moderate compared to uh, Muhammadiyah. But uh, studies uh, suggest that some of these early women movement were as progressive uh, as may be hope of Indonesian women organization today. Uh, for instance, uh, for instance, in uh, 1928, they organized um, a congress uh, attended uh, by like uh, 116 uh, organization, and uh, as uh, already demanded to the Dutch uh, colonial uh, government. Uh, to uh, increase the number of a girls' school, the education from uh, of young women, and uh, issue related to uh, marriage and uh, divorce, because uh, as you may know that in Islam, uh, divorce is uh, really easy. Just uh, say I divorce you, and then uh, divorce um, happen. And also a financial uh, financial uh, support uh, for the widows uh, whose uh, this is uh, husband had been uh, state uh, employees uh, yeah and also uh, 
in their Congress in 1935, they managed to have uh, uh, the rights to uh, suffrage, uh, to vote, uh, and some of them uh, was elected as member of the parliament and are also uh, become a uh, mayor in uh, some uh, cities. However, started uh, the, the, the new order in uh, 65, um, started to uh, control women uh, uh, movement by banning the most progressive women movement uh, that was uh, accused, affiliated uh, to Indonesian Communist Party. So as you maybe know that uh, in 1965 and 66, there is a uh, uh, military uh, purge uh, and followed by uh, the mass killing of uh, 1 million to 3 million uh, people and 11,000 11, uh, was uh, jail without uh, uh, without bringing to uh, justice. And uh, the new order of uh, strategy of uh, social and political control um, was they politicizing women organization and movement. Yeah, the mass-based organization uh, created by New Order is the uh, Family Guidance Welfare uh, Movement. Uh, this, uh, in turn, the only mass organization that village women were permitted to join at the time. And uh, this organization not only promoted and implemented official development plan at the local and national level, but it also exerted considerably control of uh, the Federation of Women Organization that was established in uh, 1928. That's, uh, that was uh, the first uh, official umbrella body of women organization that uh, organized the first uh, Congress in 1988. In effect, the government uh, co-opted these women uh, spaces and uh, has been uh, vehemently criticized by Indonesian women uh, activists that was born uh, uh, later in 1980s, uh, yeah, uh, as the uh, that uh, policy contributing to domestication of women and excluding them from the uh, public uh, sphere, yeah. Uh, but uh, actually, um, the first Indonesian uh, feminist was uh, Raden Ajeng uh, Kartini, our Indonesian uh, heroine. And uh, she introduced uh, the concept of uh, women autonomy and freedom, fighting for education for women and eradication of a child and a false uh, marriage and equality between uh, women uh, uh, and men. Uh, even uh, she was confined uh, since she was uh, 12 uh, years uh, old, but uh, she managed to uh, study and to learn um, a Dutch uh, language that, uh, uh, and then she, uh, she was able to uh, have a correspondence uh, with uh, with a friend uh, in uh, Netherlands. So uh, uh, her letters uh, then uh, published in 19, uh, 1912. 
Yeah, and uh, the books uh, inspired the establishment of modern uh, independent movement and women uh, organization. Um, that's the uh, uh, also uh, inspired the Indonesian women movement to engage with the uh, international uh, women uh, movement, uh, especially on the uh, suffrage. Yes. Uh, but, and uh, my uh, my engagement uh, uh, has only started in 1983 uh, when I was invited by the first uh, feminist uh, movement established in 1982 um, with a focus on a uh, female labor uh, issue. And uh, they managed to invite uh, feminists uh, from uh, other ASEAN uh, countries. And we learned uh, a lot uh, through the labor uh, or female labor uh, issue. And uh, in 1984, uh, again, the uh, second uh, women organization called uh, Kalyana Mitra uh, was uh, born and from them I learned a lot uh, about uh, feminism uh, and they have a, a very a big uh, library where I also learn about gender uh, and law and engage with um, most well-known uh, feminist uh, leader in Asia Pacific uh, at the time, like uh, Kamla Basin, Abba Baaya, who introduced me to uh, Sharika, Ratna Kapoor, Hina Jilani, Asma Jahangir from Pakistan, Santi Dariam from Malaysia, uh, uh, and with some of them, we uh, established in 2004, I think, uh, uh, Kartini Asia uh, Network, who focus uh, on uh, research on uh, LGBT uh, or LBT. Yeah? Uh, I myself, uh, in 1995, with other friends, um, established a uh, uh, women uh, organization called Women Solidarity for uh, Human Rights, and also Indonesian uh, Legal Aid uh, for Women. And in 1988, uh, we established uh, Indonesian Women Coalition for Justice and uh, Democracy that uh, managed uh, to uh, include uh, LBT, LBT uh, people in uh, our movement. Uh, that's, uh, I think it is uh, unique because usually uh, women movement is separated from uh, uh, LBT uh, movement or LGBT, LGBT movement uh, as uh, in general. Uh, yeah. Uh, later, I uh, will uh, explain to you uh, what uh, we did uh, or what we do in in uh, Indonesian uh, coalition. Um, yeah, um, in the context of a legal system, we inherited uh, from Dutch colonial legal system that in incorporated racial and gender-based uh, discrimination. Uh, after independent, uh, li limited changes, uh, uh, especially on family law and uh, domestic uh, violence law. And later after reformacy, we have uh, sexual, uh, anti-sexual uh, violence uh, law and uh, anti-trafficking, uh, anti-porn uh, law, 
and also, but uh, we uh, continue with uh, legal pluralism, uh, where there are two court uh, systems, Sharia court, uh, as, uh, law for Muslim, and uh, general court for non-Muslim, uh, while customary or living law also applies. That's uh, really uh, make uh, another uh, discrimination uh, against uh, women. And um, in the context of a new uh, order uh, that control uh, women, in uh, uh, it started in 1974 where uh, gender inequality is uh, institu institutionalized in the marriage law, in the fa family planning uh, policy that targeted only women, and uh, also in development uh, policy in general, where gender ideology and state egoism regime uh, was applied. And uh, until now, I think gender uh, discrimination and gender-based uh, violence persists. Women continue to face discrimination in access to education and tend uh, to hold more insecure jobs than men, have fewer economic assets, and uh, participate less in government and private sector leadership uh, role even in uh, first term of uh, Jokowi, uh, our president. Uh, now we have uh, six uh, minister, women minister. Yeah? And uh, also increasing number of uh, local uh, regulation that discriminates against women and member of marginalized uh, group, as especially uh, sexual minority group, LGBT uh, uh, group, and uh, also uh, patriarchal interpretation of holy books, culture, and social uh, norm, and no national plan of action of Article 5 of CEDO uh, uh, to eliminate uh, uh, culture and uh, social norm that uh, discriminate uh, against uh, women. So um, considering all the uh, situation at that uh, time, uh, I tried to uh, querying uh, uh, the patriarchal gender norm and uh, religious uh, teaching, working with uh, the women uh, ulama uh, to introduce, uh, we call it a women friendly interpretation of a holy book. Yeah, not only Al Quran uh, uh, for Muslim, but also. Uh, Babel and uh, yeah, Buddha and uh, Hindu, uh, because we have like a depart department of religion where uh, Sikh religion have the uh, uh, section uh, there, and we invited them to uh, discuss uh, about the new interpretation of uh, holy books including uh, heteronormativity, heterosexuality, and uh, identity uh, binaries. Yeah, uh, of course, masculinity and femininity, and uh, uh, introducing uh, uh, inclusivity, diversity, uh, yeah, uh, uh, well known uh, now by Getsi, gender equality, disability, in, in inclusivity, I think, yeah, uh, Getsi. Um, uh, and also uh, 
we uh, introduce intersectionality because we are so diverse, not only in terms of uh, race, uh, religion, uh, and language, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, so it is uh, very in, uh, important to understand uh, about intersectionality uh, concept and uh, decolonization of law and uh, conceptual uh, framework. I think uh, Alvin also touched uh, upon the decolonization. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, that we inherited uh, uh, our legal system from uh, Dutch uh, colonization. Mm, uh, that, um, uh, uh, even not like in uh, India, uh, inherited from uh, British uh, legal system, where uh, they have uh, uh, Article Three and Seventy Seven, uh, yeah, uh, prohibit the unnatural sexual relation. That's a very broad and. Uh, uh, but uh, we have uh, Article 292 uh, prohibit the sex relation uh, between uh, adult and uh, minor. That's uh, that's it. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, but uh, uh, after. Uh, uh, reformasi. Uh, that's uh, uh, we managed to establish that uh, uh, I mentioned Indonesian Women uh, Coalition for Justice and uh, Democracy, trying to unite all kind of uh, uh, sex sector. Um, uh, in the uh, of marginalized uh, groups like uh, patients, uh, farmers, uh, street children, prostitution, uh, female-headed uh, uh, household. Uh, at the time, we have uh, migrant workers. We have uh, fifteen uh, section um, a member. Um, and uh, this is the first uh, woman after uh, a new order uh, with a membership uh, organization because under a uh, new order, we uh, didn't allow to have a mass uh, organization like, uh, uh, like before 65. Most of women organization are membership uh, or were, were membership uh, organization, but after uh, 65, uh, uh, the new order, uh, yeah, yeah, we we uh, didn't allow to have membership. Uh, but after uh, reformasi, reformation in 1998, uh, uh, at the opening of uh, democratization, where all kind of organization, including religious fundamentalist, radical group, uh, uh, as well as LGBT group, were allowed to grow. Yeah, and uh, for the first time, LGBT groups was integrated uh, to a woman coalition, uh, um, along with uh, fourteen uh, other other marginalized women's group. And we managed to do advocacy on LGBT rights uh, as human rights. Uh, at the time, uh, there is no uh, reaction from fundamentalist uh, group uh, whatsoever. And uh, celebrated uh, uh, Ida Ho, yeah? Uh, and uh, also uh, uh, mushrooming of uh, LGBT group. Uh, of uh, uh, Indonesia. Sorry. 
but at the end of the uh, uh, 2015, uh, uh, backlash uh, happened. Yeah, the escalation of the fundamentalist group campaign to apply Sharia law, uh, the enaction of more than 400 regional uh, bylaws that uh, discriminate against women and LGBT people, state campaign to criminalize LGBT people via a new criminal code that was uh, enacted uh, last January, expelling students who are active in sexual rights campaign and recognized as LGBT, uh, as well as the prohibition of international funding to support LGBT groups. That's our uh, situation uh, now. But uh, I resigned um, as the first uh, General Secretary of Indonesian Coalition um, for justice and democracy because um, I was elected as member of parliament uh, at the time, 2004. Uh, and before that in 1998, uh, I was selected as member of uh, people assembly. Uh, 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 and I continue as a member of uh, the house. And um, I managed to uh, uh, introduce a bill uh, to recognize LGBT people, but a uh, fail, of course, a uh, fail, but at least become a uh, public uh, discourse. Uh, uh, everybody, what is LGBT? What is LGBT? What is lesbian? What is the uh, sexual uh, orientation? That is, uh, I uh, often invited by uh, uh, television or radio or seminar uh, explain about the concept of uh, sexual rights, sexuality, uh, uh, gender, and uh, so on. And uh, uh, also in order to uh, criticize the regional bylaws uh, that, um, uh, using uh, legal reason that uh, LGBT is uh, Western uh, imports, again, uh, our religion and also our tradition. And I managed to, uh, to explain that in our uh, tradition, especially in East Java, in my uh, region, um, and also in uh, South Sulawesi uh, and also North Sulawesi, same-sex uh, marriage is uh, common. And uh, also uh, even in uh, South Sulawesi, uh, there are uh, five uh, gender, yeah? male, uh, female, Chalalai, that's uh, F to M, and Chalabai, uh, that's uh, M to F, and uh, Bisu, that's a uh, sacred uh, gender, uh, sacred gender, maybe uh, uh, usually uh, intersex uh, people. Um, as I mentioned before, in 1995, uh, I established Indonesian Legal Aid Association for Women. Um, uh, it was established by seven women's lawyers in uh, Jakarta, and we managed to pull women uh, advocate from uh, various provinces. And uh, now we have uh, 18, 18 uh, legal aid uh, uh, office uh, throughout uh, uh, Indonesia. And uh, we, 
doing uh, uh, rebuilding feminist uh, movement by uh, doing capacity building, yeah, setting priority and develop capacity of those who are part of our movement, community organizing, building community support as our political political platform and involving uh, new people rather than only recruit the experienced one. Strengthening a network between academia, NGOs, and uh, feminist bureaucrat, or uh, yeah, femocrat, we call it femocrat, uh, using triangle of uh, women uh, empowerment, uh, introduced by uh, uh, Fargas and uh, Wieringa, uh, doing research and uh, advocacy uh, based on uh, CEDO, reflecting and strategizing, uh, yeah, uh, be critical and trying to connect what we have been doing and what we or others think about. Uh, of course, uh, using uh, uh, Gatsy uh, approach. Uh, yeah. So uh, our uh, strategies um, is doing legislative and policy advocacy at the national, regional, and international level. Um, uh, as I mentioned, promote women-friendly friendly interpretation of, of holy uh, books, working with men and youth, and um, uh, creating APIC uh, Gender Justice uh, Index. That's... Uh, um and uh yeah mm. let yeah, me we might uh, have to stop there noor because we need about yeah, uh, let me one minute uh, on the latest uh, development uh, yeah we uh, work uh, to uh, include gender diverse person uh as uh, such as uh, transgender uh, and to f uh, transgender support lgbt uh, violence and uh, discrimination uh, socializing issue of uh, heteronormativity and uh, as i mentioned reflecting uh, reflecting critically on decolonizing gender and sexuality studies particularly in relation to history city. That's uh, so. Uh, 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 I have to stop here. Sorry, yeah. Thank you, Thank you so Sarika. much, Noor. Thank you so much. And you know, for those of you who haven't uh, heard of Kartini, um, I, there is a very beautiful Indonesian movie that goes by the name Kartini. And, you know, she was one of those those uh, rulers during the colonial times who really, you know, fought for her own rights and then, you know, went ahead. And one of the first thinkers around feminism. And, and you know, it, it's, it's beautifully the way she defines women's autonomy, agency and freedom. I think there's a lot to learn. So thank you, Noor, for bringing that out to us. I also want to draw a commonality that both Arvind and Noor have been talking about in their own struggles and, and, and in the way they have fought and their own resilience and, and the entire question around religion and, and right-wing and fascist governments and, you know, how the globe itself is turning more right uh, is something that you both drew from and I would like to bring our attention to that. I do want to talk about sexuality, you know, which remains to be a trope in both Arvind and Noor's uh, uh, discourses. You know, Noor talks about family planning policy and, you know, how access to women's wombs has always been something that states are obsessed with. And, and Arvind talks about 
the whole notion of heterosexual families and and how same sex marriage really challenges that um i i think uh, when noor started she spoke about female labor the other thing that i want to bring to your attention is how in terms of social reproduction you know which is taking care of people and in a capitalist uh, economy we know that only the productive labor gets accounted for how it totally free rides on the labor of women and and hence you know there is the whole notion of new home, home economics or feminist economics but i i think same sex marriage really challenges that because these binary roles of women as caregivers and men as breadwinners gets challenged and hence we have to rethink this entire free riding on the labor and i think there i see very small strong intersections between the feminist movement and and why we are calling to call it choosing to call it a uh, queering feminist movement i also felt that intersectionality was brought forth by noor very strongly and i'm going to stop here and uh, wait for some of you to type your questions i know that people from across have been writing about how they are really interested in the issue and they would like to learn more but i'm also aware of how the feminist movement itself and by saying this i'm also turning an inward gaze you know how the feminist movement itself chooses to ignore the entire question of queering and 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 queer people and and hence you know by calling it sexuality minority at times or by saying that they might digress from the main issue and and i think we need to discuss that far more um uh, with that i kind of lead you both into olivia's question and and she's in particular asked noor but but arvin feel free to respond uh, so she she asks noor you talked about how women are discriminated when it comes to public participation and you know noor has been a member of parliament so she can also re respond to it you know from a, a first person's perspective she says i assume this includes representation in government institutions as well as in decision making bodies how about the girl child keeping in mind this intersectionality with age as a discriminating factor and what would be the avenues you would recommend for a girl child to be better represented and have more agency in governance on her own um noor would you like to respond to it rather than typing an answer i think you did speak about a lot yes. of strategies towards the end you did speak yes. about it yes and and some okay, of thank you all of you for the question uh yeah uh when i was in parliament i think we managed to have a child uh, protection law and also a uh, uh, child uh, court uh, and uh, including the protection uh, of a uh, girl child uh, of course uh, yeah and uh, recently uh, or oh, a year ago i think we managed uh, also to uh, change uh, one of the article in uh, our marriage law uh, Uh, on the uh, the eligibility eligibility uh, eligibility yeah, of a merit um, uh, in our merit law is 16 and uh, that's uh, created um, the highest uh, number in asia in asia i think Indonesia have a uh, 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 child uh, marriage. Uh, so uh, now it's in the uh, same uh, age for for men and uh, and women is uh, is nineteen nineteen years uh, old. Um, so that's uh, uh, the. the standard uh, setting for the protection of a uh, uh, girl uh, child uh, in in uh, law but um 
uh, in all, in uh, the issue of uh, representation, yeah, it's a uh, quite uh, difficult uh, uh, actually, um, because uh, I mean uh, the woman who elected in the parliament is a uh, very rare, very rare to. Uh, talk about uh, uh, girl-child uh, uh, issue as mandated by uh, Beijing uh, Platform for Action. Even they don't know about CEDO and Beijing uh, Platform uh, for Action. Uh, even uh, even the, the representation of uh, women in general uh, increase. Uh, uh we have uh, now like a 20 uh, percent out of 575 uh, member of uh, parliament this uh quite uh, progress compared to 10 years uh, ago that's uh, only uh, 18 and uh 20 years ago when I was in parliament, it's only uh, 13 uh, percent. Mm -hmm. so, so uh, yeah, I think um, in, in the uh, representation of a girl child, I don't think there is the uh, avenue for them uh, to represent to represent uh, her own yeah because it's right. considered uh, still a girl even a girl uh, consider a girl is under eighteen uh, years old uh, yeah but if they read seven years old, they can uh, vote, yeah. They have the rights uh, to vote. But not to vote for a uh, candidate who uh, under uh, 19 or under 18. No. Right, right. Thank you, Noor. And I think when you responded towards the end, you were talking a lot about a lot of strategies. I'm also asking everyone and urging everyone to think of this question more in terms of, you know, a time when during adolescence, people start discovering their own sexualities. And why is it that, that you know, people of that age have very little autonomy, you know, not even considered a full human being, a degree of unfreedom, uh, or a non-personhood, as Arvind was talking about. Um, and, you know, maybe a, a childhood itself is a very colonial concept, and we have to think a little bit more and brood a little bit more about it. Uh, we've got about five to seven minutes more. So I'm going to ask both Arvind and Noor to come up with, like, one last sentence in terms of queering feminist movement both from your perspectives. And I'm going to hand it over to Arvind first. What is the last message for this webinar that you would like to give? I think the question of rethinking, some of the concepts have been held very close and very dear. And we've had a lot of dialogues in the past on the question of privacy, and you know, and that within the Indian context, we had more of a, I think we're, uh, the feminist movement and the queer movement is on the same page on the way we understand privacy, particularly post the Supreme Court judgment. We see privacy is a right which all of us have. And again, here we go back actually to the core feminist text, which is uh, a room of one's own. And Virginia Woolf's articulation there is the idea of writing, for writing a novel, women need a room of their own. And by room of the own, you mean a psychological space where you're not troubled by this awful man saying, can I have my cup of tea? Can I have my breakfast? Can I have a lunch? Because you have that mental space. Take forward your own thinking, right? 
and that's integral to both the identity and selfhood. And so I would say that privacy is actually a very important issue, which perhaps the feminist movement needs to rethink its, its relationship to. Thank you so much, Arvind, for saying that. Thank you. Yeah, it's absolutely correct. And we need to totally transform these private spaces because the master's tool cannot dismantle the master's house. Right? Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Noor, any last words from you? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, uh, queering is a uh, uh, very important uh, concept and uh, a tool for questioning uh, uh, what we uh, fighting along our history, yeah? uh, since uh, years ago, gender, hetero, uh, sexuality, sexuality, and uh, so on. Uh, but also, um, uh, as a tool of uh, historical uh, analysis, um, to uh, fight uh, against the uh, conservative um, uh, teaching of the uh, holy book. So uh, we have to uh, go back to our tradition, to our history. In our history, like uh, for example, uh, why his hijra in Pakistan, uh, finally in the Islamic uh, countries, finally uh, recognized. Uh, as a gender uh, identity because they managed to uh, campaign that Hijra is their, uh, our history. And here in Indonesia, we also um, are fighting against uh, heteronormativity by uh, mentioning uh, our history everywhere that uh, before uh, colonial time, we uh, have already uh, recognized uh, same-sex uh, relation, even uh, same-sex uh, methods. That, uh, um, yeah. Uh, even, Thank you. Even now, the situation is rather gloomy in Indonesia. Thank but, you so much, Noor. Yeah, yeah. I think the diversity of gender identities about which you spoke, you know, five different types, and 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 you also invoke a very strong decolonial discourse through that, and and going back history and reviving some of that. Um, with that, I want to thank everyone who came here and attended today's uh, discussion. Um, I hope that, that we are able to sit in many study circles like these. And I hope that we are able to initiate this dialogue as to not exclude queer, but, but take it in, in, in the whole spirit that we are. When I was growing up and I was, became a part of the feminist movement, we would often talk about political lesbianism. And I really ascribe to that, which was more about strengthening our networks, you know, across and pluriversal and rainbow is what I take from here. So thank you everyone who came today. And I hope to see you all soon. Special thanks to Noor, Arvind and Brian. And I really hope to meet you in person soon. Bye everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.